does he do? He might go all the way. He gives it a ride. It's a chance. It'll be a goal. They've broken the duck and they have clinched their first win of the season. Heaney returned to form with four goals while captain Josh Kennedy continued his stunning run of form. Zach Jones showed that he can play midfield while Tom Papley left the best until last. You are listening to the Swans Blogs Swans Cast, the number one Sydney Swans fans podcast. In this week's episode, we review the Swans third round win against Carlton on Saturday afternoon. We talk about the midfield performance, Longmire's inspired coaching moves, Tom McCartan's shock move to defence, and give you our Sunday champions and villains. Apologies in advance, everyone. I've got a bit of a sore throat, but we're going to kick on with it anyway. I'm Justin Mitchell, and with me is Swanscast regular Joshua Ma, and for his first time, Matthew Dunkerley. Matt, you're a Sydney-based Swan supporter. How did you find the win in Melbourne on the weekend? I thought it was amazing. It was good to see the Swans play consistent football for four quarters rather than just flashes of brilliance like in the game against the Bulldogs where, you know, we're out of the game for 50% of it. And Joshua, like we talked about in our preview podcast, all we wanted was four quarters of effort. I'm one happy camper this week. Four quarters of effort. I didn't care about the score, but the score was even better. Got the best of both worlds this week, and I'm a happy boy. I think the most positive thing that came out of that match, aside from the fact we won, was the fact that Carlton are no longer that easy beat team that they once were. They performed to a pretty high level. Yeah, they did. And and we spoke about that last week as well. But I think we said it was going to be a 50-50 uh, chance of getting a win or a loss uh, based on last week's form. Clearly, the odds were more in our favour this week than we thought they were last week. Uh, but Carlton certainly weren't the easy beats that they have been in the past. No. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how they go next time we have to face them again. Look, we'll kick off straight into the top of the agenda. The Swans, they finally won their first game of the season. And they've also snapped a four-game losing streak that goes back to round 23 against Hawthorne. So they finally put the nightmares of those four matches behind. They've finally scored more than 70 points. And they've got the highest score in about 12 or 13 rounds of football. And the last time they... Well, they haven't beaten 100 points yet, but the last highest score previous to that was the Fremantle game we keep coming back to in the last couple of podcasts, Josh. So it's good to finally kick some goals, Josh. Yep, certainly um, doing more than sort of, you know, 10 goals, four or whatever it's going to be for a match um, and sort of scoring under 70 points. It's it's nice to have a little bit more in the bank. Um, I think the scoreline is... You sort of look at it and go, well, maybe the Swannies just fell over the line a little bit. Um, but I don't think that's quite the case. I think because of the the unusual defensive structure or personnel that we ran uh, the other night, I think it took a little while for things to yeah. get going in the first quarter with so many new guys down back. And a couple of the mistakes just on three-quarter time probably gave a couple away that we shouldn't have. But other than that, I thought that goal scoring-wise, it was good to um, put on a reasonable score for once, and to not have Lance yeah. Franklin as the main goal kicker. You absolutely cannot agree with that more. So, Matt, one of the things we talked about on the last podcast was the fact that for the last two weeks, the Swans have only kicked one goal in their first quarter. Both teams, they kicked 11 between them in the first quarter. Was that an exciting change of Swans mentality for you? I think it was really exciting, and I actually love the new 666 rule because it means that your ball getters in the middle, you know, they've got a clear forward line to kick into, and it opens the game up for high scoring. One of the things, that, though, that I really enjoyed seeing on the weekend was a couple of times Franklin did some really good lead, and the Swans players looked over him and hit a better target in the middle. And we got goals through other avenues, which in previous games, I haven't seen that. Yeah, the team certainly has been Franklin-centric, and they've definitely been accused of that in the past. One of the shock moves that I don't think anyone really saw coming was the move of Tom McCartan into defence. Were you expecting that, Matt? Or were you sort of expecting something a little bit different with Malikan coming out of the side and Thurlow coming in? I wasn't expecting McCartan to play defence. I was expecting him to definitely play forward. But I think with Thurlow and McCartan, it took a little bit of time to gel. But I think both of those players played really good games. 
And I think it gives us more leg speed in defence because Melikin is a good one-on-one defender, but he doesn't have time. No, he's not the quickest player across the field. I think that was really accentuated on the weekend, Josh. That difference in mobility and pace and ability to really just impact the contest. Did you see that as one of the main reasons that the Swans' defence was able to keep the Carlton team out after quarter time? Yeah, I definitely did. It, it's funny that, that, well, it's not funny, but it's interesting that this happened this week because only a couple of casts ago we spoke about why did we go out and stack up on a forward when we're actually looking for another defender after uh, Maybaum did his yeah. ACL in the preseason? And we went, oh, well, maybe the plan is just to ship Handy down back on occasion. <laughs> and you made that comment about that would just be, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul and, you know, making a pact with the devil. And it wouldn't be a good move. But neither of us thought that McCartan would be the forward that would go down back and do the job. And, and I guess it makes sense because as a forward, even though he's a young bloke, he reads the flight of the ball pretty well. He works on leads. He's got good closing speed. And he always halves a contest and brings it to ground. So it actually makes him a pretty good fit to have a crack at centre half back. And we sort of were aghast in the sands. We're like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Um, what's McCartan doing down in the back line? And by quarter time, we were thinking, wow, McCartan's yeah. down the back line. This is, this good, is good work. work yeah. it, was, it was a good move. And I was we were really happy to watch it from the stands. It, 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 it worked, and it worked well. And it got better as the game went on as well. He's a decent forward who's pretty quick on the lead. But the one thing I think he's really struggled with was in that first season, his physical strength maybe wasn't there. So I think with Rampy being a pretty good one-on-one defender and reasonably quick, and you've also got Aaliyah, who's pretty quick and very good in the air. You really need someone who may not be physically strong like a Ted Richards, but could really get to that contest even late and just have an impact. And I think I think it was an inspired move. But I'm not going to say any more on that subject because that's going to come a little bit later in the show. So now it's time for our Sunday champions and villains. So Matthew, can you please give us your Sunday champion? So my Sunday champion... This week was JPK and the head-to-head battle with Paddy Cripps. I mean, Paddy Cripps is a young inside bull. He he played really well, actually, with 13 clearances, you know, kicked a goal. And I thought Cripps was definitely Carlton's best player. But, you know, last year it may not have been his best season. But the work he did on the weekend yeah. with seven clearances, a goal... And, you know, really good disposal efficiency. I just thought it was saying the Kennedy of old. We do. And the thing is, um, Kennedy easily picked up the three Brownlow votes last week. And he got the 10 coaches votes. There's every chance he's going to pick up at least seven to eight coaches votes. I would say a bare minimum seven coaches votes this week. So there's a good chance to pick up two, if not another three Brownlow votes. Joshua, could you give us your Sunday champion, please? Uh, yeah, my uh, my Sunday champion is actually Aaron Phillips, the captain of AFLW team in Adelaide for the Crows. I was lucky enough uh, at about two o'clock this morning to be sitting in a bar in Melbourne, and they actually had the replay of the AFL Women's um, Grand Final up on one of the screens. Uh, and I watched most of that game up to the point that she did her ACL injury. Um, what I would say is that for all the knockers out there who are really heavily against AFL Women's based on the quality of the gameplay, and how it's not as good or not as exciting as they want it to be. And, and and just the usual, you know, the male versus female comparison, you know, one sucks, one's fantastic. Um, I would point to her and say that this, that is where this that competition is going to end up. They just have to wait for the generational change to happen. And it's always going to be the case. It was never going to be... Um, that amazing competition that everyone, you know, expected it to be from day dot. But she's the shining example of how that competition will end up. Um, and I would say that, and, uh, and not only that, she's also a fantastic athlete as well. And if they don't rename uh, yeah. their best and fairest award, their Brownlow equivalent after her at some stage, now that she's won it twice, I'll eat my hat. Um, but she's my champion for the week just for being a fantastic athlete and the example of where AFLW is going to end up. Erin Phillips, she is a great champion to have. And the class that was shown on the field when she went off with her ACL injury from both teams was superb. 
So my Sunday champion, uh, I was going to go with one. Uh, I'm going to go with two, and I'm going to be very brief on both of them. Uh, the first one is Longmire's McCartan move and general coaching. I thought he did a superb job of coaching, but the McCartan move was inspired. We talked about it a little bit before, so we don't have to talk too much about it, but it was very Ted Richards-like, and I thought it was just a great move. Now, I had these notes prepared during the Suns and Western Bulldogs match, and this is why I've got two champions and at the same time, two villains. But my second champion is Stewie, who ate all the pies due. I think he <laughs> has been superb and he's really transformed that club. And they've won two out of three games. And to be honest, they could be, well, you know, they could be out without a loss this season if they didn't go down by one point to St. Kilda. And St. Kilda have been equally impressive. So Alan Richardson, head on the chop block, he's got two wins already. Stewie Jew's got the Suns playing a pretty good brand of football. And Fagan's got the Lions absolutely ramping up there. They're rampant. They're, I mean, they're going to be hard to beat for any team at the Gabba. It's an exciting time for these so-called salad dwellers to actually come out and really prove their critics wrong. So I'm I'm really happy for Stewie Jew. I think that's a cracking one to have. Um, I I really wish that we had kept Stewie Jew. I I honestly thought he was going to be part of the secession planning in Sydney. Um, but to see what he's been able to do to the Suns uh, in such a short time frame, it's been really good to watch. And I'm I'm really interested to see with what happens with the Suns going forward. Now straight into villains, Matt. Give us your first villain, mate. Yeah, I'd really love to see the SCG just ready for AFL and, you know, the turf just looking beautiful. And, you know, the Swans struggled a bit at the SCG last year and, you know, in recent time. And especially being a Sydney-based member, there's nothing better than going to the SCG, you know, one of the oldest grounds in Australia. The SCG is a great place to watch football and, it's probably right up there. You know, the MCG, the home of football, is probably better, but the SCG is still a great stadium. It is. It is. It's a great, it is a great venue to go and watch football, and I've been there for a few finals, and it's been an absolute treat. Joshua, your Sunday villain, please. Uh, my villain this week is Damien Hardwick, but it's not specifically Damien Hardwick. It's anyone who uses Damien Hardwick-like arguments to support the actions of one of their players, which is clearly not in the best interest of the game. And it's uh, regarding the, um, the controversy Dustin Martin's found himself in in the last couple of days. Not so much because of his, let's say, hand gestures at people <laughs> on the sideline, uh, but more to do with the striking off, off the ball. So I think Damien's uh, argument was basically that um, people pay a lot of money to come and watch guys like Dusty play. And, you know, as the ball carrier, they should get looked after by the umpires and be protected. And I, I'm in two minds about that. In some way, he's kind of right. But I think we also know what would happen if uh, John Longmire came out last night and said, hey, why didn't you pay a few free kicks to, to Lance Franklin for being held by Liam Jones for half the game? Um, and, and conversely, if you compare that incident to um, another player who I think has probably got suspensions for things that had lesser force or intent than what Dustin Martin did last night. And his suspensions have been considerably longer than what they're talking about for Martin. And that's Tom Hawkins. Yeah. If Tom Hawkins had have done that, Tom Hawkins would get three to four weeks and then he'd get executed just for being a Geelong Cat player. <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't, want to, I don't want to see any more of this perception or situation developing where players who are big name players get looked after for doing very ordinary things. And I, I think Damien's comments were very uh, off base. It really makes you wonder if he'd made those comments to detract from the fact that they just copped an absolute flogging by GWS. They got three of their best four players out injured. Dustin Martin's going to have a holiday. They're going to really struggle to field a competitive side over the next month. One thing on that as well that I've noticed is due to some of their players' big pay packets, the last couple of off-seasons have really seen their depth go to other clubs. Like, they don't have the players yeah. to call upon that they did last year or the year before. And especially with injuries, you know, Rams is the best defender in the game. You, how are they going to cover this? And it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. Well, the same thing's happened with Sydney um, going back from 2013 through 2017, essentially, when we brought in Franklin. We had to offload a couple of our quality depth players. 2014, we had to offload more. 2015, we were offloading even more. Last year, we delisted or traded 13 players off our list. We've managed to keep Rose, though. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, he's he's a star <laughs> of the future. <laughs> Number one, here we go. No, but uh, look, it's our quality of depth disappeared after we picked up Franklin and Tippett. So uh, it's expected. And that's how equalization works. You get brought back to the pack after a period of success. I do have, again, two villains. Uh, I'll be very quick on one of them because I'm not sure if you guys saw this, but the umpiring in the Dogs and Suns match I thought was an utter disgrace. The Suns deserved to win the match. They didn't deserve to win it by five. They should have won it by more. But that last quarter in particular with the umpiring was so unbelievably biased. It was 2016 grand final level bad. Some of the calls were just mind-boggling. And I am thrilled that the Suns won it. That's why I had Stewie Jew as one of my champions so look afl sort your shit out get the umpiring right because it's going from polar opposites every single week and there is absolutely no consistency whatsoever second villain is james hurd now did you happen to hear what james hurd said during the week in an interview i didn't actually i've heard a few murmurs about james hurd and before this weekend essendon playing really badly and you know was Worst fold is in the chopping block, but no, I didn't actually hear the comment from her. So basically what had happened was in an interview, he was asked about what he wants to do, his journey coming out of, you know, the coaching issues and all that sort of stuff. But he was asked the question, would you consider a return to senior coaching? And his response was never say never. That drew immediate condemnation from all quarters in the AFL sector, in AFL media, just everyone. Uh, you had uh, Tony Shaw basically saying if he was a father of one of the kids who was injected with drugs, he would have strangled him. That, that's basically how angry people were at not only James Hurd, but the club's actions. So I, I think for him to kind of say never say never about a potential coaching return. I'm not entirely sure how I've managed to miss this. Um, I didn't realize it was a story, but I did see a meme on Facebook and I actually assumed it was a joke. <laughs> I didn't realize it was actually a thing that had happened. Yes. So the meme says... Um, it says uh, it says coaching again, maybe one day, but for now I'm focusing on my training and nominating for the mid-season draft. And I I thought, oh, yeah, that's kind of funny. But but just looking at the dates on this post on this particular page, it, it was actually a news story. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's interesting. Yeah, look, um, I think he needs to just stay away from AFL, full stop. And I think people need to stop talking to him about it. Let's get straight into the weekend review. So we finally won our first match of the season. We did it without Buddy kicking a big bag, but we did have two pretty significant injuries. So Will Haywood, who's going to miss at least three weeks of football, suffered a broken jaw. And Jared McVeigh, his age has probably caught up with him on this one. He suffered a quad injury, and that's usually anywhere from four to eight weeks. We've seen Sam Reed last year. He missed an entire season of football from a quad injury, and his was originally graded as 10 weeks. So I hope we see Jared McVeigh again, because he was really good, and he's been a crucial player for us over the last two years. Matt, were you impressed by the weekend? Yeah, I was really impressed with the team just four quarters of really good footy and like you say Jared McVeigh is like a wine he's just getting better with age and he really controlled the game and losing him is a big loss uh, I mean moving forward we've got guys that can come into the team like potentially Clark or Melican can come back but they're not going to be able to do what McVeigh did on the weekend and uh, I was watching the Haywood hit on TV and that was brutal. Like, you, as soon as the contest happened, you knew the kid was in trouble. I was hoping it was just a concussion, and by just a concussion, I don't mean it's a good thing. But I was hoping that, you know, he would be fine, but he's going to be a big loss. He kicked a couple of really good goals before the injury. He's a low-possession player, but... I really think in our forward line, he's important. I was pretty pretty chuffed. Uh, we got most of what we talked about last week, and that was four quarters of effort. I was a little bit disappointed with the last two or three minutes of the third quarter. Um, the 50 metre uh, that Sinkers gave away was a little bit uh, careless, I guess, um, is the way to put it. And uh, we really let them waltz out with uh, that next centre clearance, which resulted in another goal to the Blues just on three-quarter time. So that was a little bit disappointing. But overall, I thought it was a pretty solid hit out. It was certainly an improvement on the on the two weeks beforehand. And there were some big gains by some people. So one of the players that, that really impressed me again was Tommy Papley playing out of the middle. I think we're getting more 
more value out of him than you know we could have possibly expected. I think we all saw him uh, when we first got him as you know nothing but a, a sort of crumbing small forward. But he really is a little powerhouse in the middle at the moment. And a lot of our clearance is actually very dependent on Papley being in there. Jones finally gave us the kind of game we need from him. Um, so yeah, look, his kicking's always going to be a little bit shoddy. Uh, but that was four quarters of consistent hard work by him. And despite the fact he still shanked a few kicks, he's, uh, his disposal efficiency was over 70%. Um, and that's where we need him to be, I think, if he's going to become a fixture in our midfield. As far as injuries go, uh, the McVeigh one, I actually didn't realise he was off the field. I had this sort of moment of fright, you know, halfway through the fourth. I'm like, oh my goodness, we're slowing down and we're going to get overrun or here we go. And then you pointed out to me that we're actually down to two rotations and that Mac had gone off with the quad. Yeah. So part of what we do is just possession football. I think a part of it was we were just starting to run out of legs. But Macca, I think, I hope to see Macca back, but he's an old man in terms of football these days. In fact, the people sitting behind us at the game were screaming out, why can no one catch him? He's 400 years old. <laughs> um, but a little bit, there's just a little bit of a chance I think that we that we may have seen the last game from Jared McVeigh. If this quad doesn't come along, if we go into a Sam Reed type thing, yeah. I would be surprised if Macca came back again next year as a player. I would see him back as a coach. Um, and I think we've got a couple of types who could replace him. Colin O'Reardon replaced him yep. uh, for a few games last year and actually did a pretty good job considering the experience base he's coming on. Uh, with the Will Hayward injury, though, uh, that, that looked terrible from where we were sitting. I, I'm with you, Matt. I thought he was going to have a concussion the way he hit the ground. Instead, he's only only <laughs> got a fractured jaw. I don't think he is as embedded in our forward line yet as he could or maybe should be. So I don't think the loss is going to be drastic yeah. for us, but it probably means another debutant up forward. The one thing there, though, is Ben Ronk, for me, has been a little disappointing recently. I wonder if it's a, a fitness thing more than the form issue because he wasn't fit when the season started. And the Swans came out and, and they said he wasn't fit and he had to play, well, he was going to play one kneeful game. He played the one kneeful game. He got through it unscathed, but I mean, he wasn't very impressive in the kneeful. So it's, I thought it was a bit of a surprise he was selected. Uh, his first game against Adelaide, he barely lasted 50, 60 minutes. I don't think he was going to last 30. He still looked like he couldn't last 30. So I think it's a fitness issue. You just can't play them. At the end of the day, you need 22 fit players out there that are, that are going to give their all rather than carrying someone. Longmire said that Heaney was lucky that he didn't suffer a syndemosis injury last week. And they've been talking about him actually injuring his ankle in the last JLT match. And he's been carrying his ankle injury for well over a month now. So I think that also talks about the depth of the team that he's so important because there is no depth. The depth is players who haven't even played yet. Yeah, and and we, we've been a little. And I guess what we were talking about during last year's podcast um, is that the guys who would have debuted for us last year in some of these sort of flanking winger type positions um, are still not available. So, and I'm really thinking of Matty Ling when I talk about yeah, this. Yeah, I, I was waiting for the day that Matty Ling would get a run. And then he had surgery on that toe and went, okay, well, he'll be available next year, but something's still going wrong and we still don't have him available to play. So, Well, apparently he wasn't able to restart training until like December. And even then we're talking gradual training. So he had six months completely off football. But look, we'll talk about some of the stats. So Buddy Franklin, nine score involvement from 12 touches. He finished with two goals one. I would say Liam Jones probably had his number throughout the game, but Liam Jones was kind of wearing him like a really snug jacket. As in, he was clinging to him. I thought he, he did okay, considering uh, he was definitely stiff. And in the last quarter, he, f he finally let his frustration go uh, and gave away a silly free kick. But he should have got at least six, I think, on, on six different occasions. Uh, we touched on Zach Jones before, but Zach Jones and Josh Kennedy both finished with 31 touches and seven clearances, which is absolutely massive. But Kennedy finished with eight tackles. So the numbers between Patrick Cripps and Kennedy, as he said earlier, Matt, Kennedy 31, Cripps uh, I think 27, 28. Cripps had 13 clearances to Kennedy 7. They both had I think 8 tackles each but Kennedy had the goal, Cripps didn't and Cripps had I think 22 contested possessions to Kennedy's. Cripps actually kicked a 1-1. One, one. Oh that's right, he did. He kicked a goal in the first quarter. And they both had an inside 50s, you know, they both did one percenters. They both play really good inside games. Amazing. And that's what you need in the new 666 formation when you can't put an extra defender back. You know, guys like Kennedy and Cripps yeah. 
winning the ball, getting the ball into the forward line fast. That's how you're going to kick a big score. That and that's true. And in fact, uh, it's actually interesting to bring that up because today there was an article in uh, the Sunday Herald Sun uh, down here in Vic that covered how uh, the, the new 666 has changed the way things are working and how important scoring from centre clearances uh, has become. Uh, more so than it was under the previous um, system, and it's really an area that the Swannies need to work on. We're actually, we're actually the second worst team for conceding points from centre clearances in the comp at the moment, and the worst team is North Melbourne. Um, so while we score uh, 18 points from centre clearances ourselves per game, uh, we're conceding 40 from centre wow, clearances. Wow, that's huge. Which, yeah, a, a negative 22 differential, and I think that North was only they were conceding 24 points. And the further up your table, it went pretty, you know, it, it obviously got a lot less down into single digits. Yeah. Um, and Carlton is well above us on that table for points conceded from centre clearances. So it really is something that the Swannies are going to have to work on. And look, we'll touch on some of those stats in a second, but I just want to have a quick chat about Isaac Heaney. Both Cripps and Kennedy were absolutely amazing for their teams, but Isaac Heaney, he, he was the difference. He won the game. And he kicked goals, I think, in every single quarter of the match. And he actually kicked basically the ceiling the ceiling goal. So I thought his return to form, just so good, so consistent. Um, He's so smooth. He's like a Rolls Royce. He just rolls around and he does his business. Beautiful game. We just need that week in, week out from Heaney because he's been carrying the injury and he hasn't had the impact on the game. But Heaney is one of our most important players to actually score goals. And, you know, he's a clutch moment player as well. He'll take the big mark in defence. He'll kick a goal when you need it. And we need him playing like that every week. Well, speaking of disposal efficiency, during the match in the third quarter, the Swans were going at 78% to Carlton's 65. So that was really impressive to see that the players had gone from their low 60s to barely getting 70% over the last two matches to really like shifting their focus and really sharpening their ball movement. Some of the other things, we destroyed Carlton in disposals. Despite the fact we only won by 19 points, we were plus 107 disposals. Interestingly, only plus four contested possessions. So that means that we had 103 more uncontested possessions. And that also leads to like a massive difference in marks as well. We had minus seven clearances. And speaking of what you said before, Josh, about scores conceded from center clearances, Carlton got us a number of times on this. We had Cripps. I think Ed Kernow got two of his goals through direct center clearances, and it shows we had minus five center clearances for minus seven all up. We were 16 to 11 behind. We were equal on inside 50s at 54 each. Despite the fact that we were getting killed in clearances, we had five more marks inside 50, 13 to eight. We had plus eight hit outs. Callum Sinclair just destroyed Carlton on this matter, and we had 18 tackles in the green. It was 70 to 52. So Callum Sinclair had one of his career best games, but I think even his game as good as it was, was overshadowed by just how good Heaney, Kennedy and Jones were on the day. And Papley was another one who has had an outstanding start to the season. So my best, which is the Swans Blogs Player of the Year, had Heaney with five, Kennedy with four, Jones with three, Sinclair with two, and Papley with one. Now, do you think Cripps gets the three Brownlow votes purely for carrying not only Carlton's midfield and their team, but also um, Papley on his back? Yeah, that that was quality. <laughs> that actually <laughs> made me laugh, seeing that footage. Oh, it was brilliant. Myself, Josh, and Steve were at the game, and that happened right in front of us, and the whole stand was just laughing. It was one of the one of the class moments of the match. So... In case, for those who are listening, in case you haven't seen it, go to the Swans blog on Twitter and Facebook. We have posted the picture of Tom Papley on on Patrick Cripps' back. It's pretty funny. Uh, there's a caption this on it. So go on, put in the caption. And there's also another caption this moment where Tom Papley is being tackled and he's got his dax being pulled down and he's got some funky looking underwear on. So go on there, caption it and have your fun with it. Social media time, guys, we put a question out to our listeners. What was your favorite moment in our round three clash against Carlton on Saturday afternoon? Josh, what was your favorite moment on Saturday afternoon? Uh, My favorite moment on Saturday afternoon was actually the Tom Papley incident being picked up by Patrick Cripps. Um, (laughs) It was great. Because just there's a certain amount of irony in that, that Patrick Cripps carries his whole team and he carries the opposition players as well. So uh, that did it for me, that moment. 
Mine was probably actually seeing Haywood come back to the bench after the big hit. Although he's injured, it was good seeing him up and about. Like, you just don't want to see those things on a football field, but they happen. So that's probably it. We're glad he's okay, and fortunately it's not too bad of an injury. Uh, he's just going to have to deal with um, soup and jelly and things that he probably doesn't like for the next two to three weeks. <laughs> yeah, hope, hope he's got a blender. <laughs> yeah. Now, Fran from Facebook. She said when Sinclair came back on after having his head and half his face taped, then still managed to win clearances. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but he quite literally looked like the mummy when he finally came out of the uh, sarcophagus and he had all the bandages falling off him. It was a pretty funny look. He he literally had an eye patch. So it was, it was great that he actually still came back out there. It actually remind me of Jude Bolton. Like, and that was actually the first thing I thought of when I saw Sinker's Des from Twitter, he said when Buddy grabs a ball deep in the forward pocket, scrubs a kick to goal square where Papley at full speed soccers a brilliant goal from the side of his right boot. That was a fantastic moment and that was probably one of the highlights that Ben Ronk had despite the fact he shanked the kick spectacularly. We had Wayne from Facebook, he said the final siren. Sean from Facebook, he says Jones proves all wrong and locks his spot in the middle with his grunt and we now need to throw the bank at him next year to keep him on. I'm not sure it's about proving people wrong, though, Shawnee. I think um, I think what Jones did is is probably what's been expected he would give for a while now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jonathan from Twitter, he also talks about the Papley incident, but he says, Crips wearing a Papley pack. I love that one. That's a good one. And Jamie from Twitter says Heaney's banana goal, which was his first of four goals from the pocket, which is a good one. That was a really good conversion as well. So nearing the end of our show, we just want to give a couple of shout outs to uh, what is happening on the blog at the moment. So in case you don't know, we have added the ability for our listeners and our fans to put in their own player ratings after each match. So if you don't know how to do that, go to our blog, go to the player ratings section that's under players, find the latest article, and then you will see buttons to add your ratings. Once you do that, you can add in a rating between 0 and 10 for every single player, hit save, and your ratings go into the bucket. Also, we will be launching a new podcast stream. It's going to be a semi-regular podcast. It is going to be the Swans cast interview with prominent, popular, and well-known Sydney Swans fans. Who it is, you'll soon find out. And we're going to be launching that stream on our Patreon website. Now, that's going to be a free stream, so people will be able to listen to that. We are going to be launching content for our fans and our members and our supporters on Patreon. So make sure you get over there, check it out. If you're supporting us already, thank you so much. It helps us keep this site and keeps the lights on and keeps the servers ticking. Now, next game is on Thursday, so we will be recording on Wednesday night once the teams are released. So make sure you're listening for next one. We're going to make it short and sweet. It is going to be a little bit less than this one. It'll probably only be about 20 minutes as we do a very quick preview. So guys, until next time, go Swans. Go Swans. Go Swannies.